Yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks for having me. Uh, exciting times for human milk oligosaccharides, or short HMOs. Um, I think there's a body of uh, work that shows that oligosaccharides have both direct and indirect effects on the infant. Let's start with the indirect first. So uh, oligosaccharides are always seen as the prebiotic, the first prebiotic that uh, human infants are exposed to. So they start shaping microbial communities in the infant gut. And then through those microbial communities and their metabolites, then there's an indirect effect on the infant as well. But it goes a bit further than that. It's not just food for bugs. It's also antimicrobial effects where certain oligosaccharides work on certain pathogens and have them stop grow or kill them altogether. Um, there is uh, uh, anti-adhesive effects where certain pathogens need to adhere to the infant's epithelial cell wall, which they can't in the presence of oligosaccharides because the oligosaccharides serve as soluble decoy receptors and prevent the attachment of certain pathogens. So that's indirect effects where oligosaccharides do something to microbial communities and then benefit potentially the infant. Um, there's also direct effects. So we see that the oligosaccharides, independent of microbial uh, communities, have effects on epithelial cells, epithel epithelial cell programming, immune cells, immune cells either in the intestine locally or systemically, since some of the oligosaccharides make it into the uh, systemic circulation and then are excreted um, intact in the urine as well. Right, so human milk and necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, it's a decade-long uh, story really where the statistics clearly show that human milk-fed infants are at a much, much lower risk to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. So if you turn that around, formula-fed infants are at a much higher risk to develop NAC. And the question is always, okay, what is it in human milk that potentially benefits the infant? And can we really find out what the mechanism is behind that? So what we've done is we looked in a preclinical model first, so in an animal model, to see if human milk oligosaccharides as the complex mixture have an effect, and they did. Uh, and then we asked the question, which oligosaccharide is it? And we narrowed it down by multidimensional chromatography to see if we identify one specific structure uh, that is protective. So in the rat model, we find that there is one oligosaccharide called DSLNT, which is short for disylyl lactoantetrose. Now, that's an animal model. Animal models are not that great in this area. Usually they're not, because an animal is an animal and a human is a human. So what we did in parallel is design a cohort study where we had very low birth weight infants and sampled milk that was fed to those very low birth weight infants over the first 28 days of life. And then looked at oligosaccharide composition in those milk samples and compared milk samples that were given to infants that later developed NAC and matched controls where the infants did not develop NAC. And we found indeed that in the ones that developed NAC, that very same oligosaccharide was at much, much lower concentrations than it is in the ones that don't develop NAC. So the overlap of preclinical and this cohort study gives us greater confidence that what we see in the not so good preclinical model uh, seems to really hold up and translate to the human infant as well. Great question, the multi-million dollar question. So, uh, you know, ideally, uh, if you look at human milk oligosaccharide composition in milk, we always say it's like a fingerprint. Every mom has a different composition of oligosaccharides, which is fairly stable over the course of lactation. And the question is, what drives that? Is it possible to change mom's diet or exercise regime or whatever it can be um, to change the oligosaccharide composition? Well, the question is, why do we want to change oligosaccharide composition in the first place? I think we're not quite there yet to say this is a more favorable oligosaccharide composition than this. So we don't really have a target. But first, data really shows that, for example, diet seems to have an impact on oligosaccharide composition. Exercise seems to be having an effect. Uh, so we're really trying to dissect what are the genetic and environmental factors that contribute to oligosaccharide synthesis and how can that explain the variation that we find really from mom to mom? Um, 